Thank you, Artie. Thank you very much for the invitation. Now, you've noticed that we have in this session two brilliant East Coast-based uh, dermatologists who will be talking about intellectually important issues when it comes to psoriasis therapy. I'm the simple guy, right, the Midwestern simple guy. And so I'm going to give a little talk today and try to m impress upon you that psoriasis therapy is actually really easy. Uh, and I'm going to put it in the context of a little bit psoriatic arthritis. I've dealt a lot with psoriatic, arth oh, psoriatic arth arthritis over time. But really, I just want to give you, using cases, to get a sort of simple framework to think about how you go about treating these folks who walk in uh, to your office. So I have lots of conflicts of interest, as I think pretty much any speaker in this I issue will have. So this is the phrase that every resident that I've worked with for generations has dreaded. There are three ways to treat psoriasis because that means that I'm going to go into a dissertation that's going to last maybe five minutes when you only have six minutes to see a patient in, in a dermatology office. That's a long time. And there, the, the deep sigh that takes place, oh, God, he's going to do it again. But thinking about it, it actually makes sense when you think about all the agents that Bruce just talked about. You have to think about them systematically when you introduce it to the patient. And if you do it the same way every time and think about it the same way every time, it becomes really quite easy. So the three ways, topical therapy, creams, ointments, gel solutions, corticosteroids versus non-steroidal. There are going to be new uh, non-steroidals coming out in the next year. So if you think about it, you have, well, 30 agents to begin with that you have to talk to each patient about every one of them, right? Just in topicals. It's not true. Phototherapy. Now, I don't think most of you have phototherapy units in there in your office, but there are multiple choices there. And then you have the systemic therapies, which uh, Bruce just talked about. I like to call it the... the uh, biologic zoo. You know, 80 per, I was talking to the uh, cab driver on the way to the hotel yesterday. You know, 80% of all TV commercials are on psoriasis therapy, right? And guess what? The reason it is, is because we have a lot of agents that work. And so you have to be able to figure these things out and present it in a quick and efficient way to your patients that you're taking care of for multiple other reasons as well. There is a complexity to treating psoriasis, but it's really figuring out what you're treating. And that's the thing I always um, emphasize to trainees or to anyone who's working with me. You need to know what you're actually treating, what your goal is. And that's a central thing that we sometimes for, we lose sight of when we're seeing patients. So there's direct impact of psoriasis itself. How much disease is acceptable? Does everyone need to be clear? You might hear some of our colleagues uh, talking about every patient wants to be clear. That's silly, right? Uh, there's a safety and risk benefit part of um, all therapies, so you have to keep that in mind. Comorbid disease. Now, we think of psoriatic arthritis as a comorbid disease to the real disease that's psoriasis, right? Um, but we also think like uh, cardiovascular disease and depression. And I actually might argue that economic issues are a major comorbid condition uh, with psoriasis as well. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. And then the number of treatments available complicates it um, exponentially just because there's so many things you can think of what topical to use in conjunction with what's systemic. Hopefully over the next 25 minutes or so, we're going to make it a little simpler to think about. On the judging where you start and, and how you go about treating, I think the most important thing is what's the impact of psoriasis on health? And this is a study, and it's the best study that's been done on all colors mortality with psoriasis, called the IHOPE study. It was, out of, it was done, uh, out of a British data uh, set done by Megan No. Um, and what it looks at is actually body surface area involved. So Bruce showed you the uh, Delphi of the International Psoriasis Council version of what's mild and what's modern and what patients are eligible for systemic therapy. I'm going to give you a slightly different perspective of thinking about that. So if you look at it and look at all-cause mortality, and that's sort of a, a reference for just overall health, patients with psoriasis um, in their model, over 10% body surface area had significant impact. Uh, impact is greater than being a smoker and less than being a diabetic. What does that mean when I see a patient with psoriasis? Especially consider that people who had less than 10% body surface area really didn't have any impact on their overall health. It means to me that over 10% body surface area and your palm of your hand is approximately 1% of your body surface area. So you can actually, usually when you do that, most people are like trying to figure out what that means. Um, if you think about that, it means that over 10%, you got to get those people better. Under 10%, 
it becomes a quality of life question. It's not that um, you have to tell patients they have to get better. You don't push them to treat their psoriasis in any aggressive fashion. But many of those patients should be treated because it's having a major impact on their life. But it becomes a quality of life question, not an overall health question. And it's a distinction that I think is important. The other major comorbid disease, and really getting to the uh, basis of how you think about what you're treating is uh, between psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. So if you've ever had the uh, question of, you need a figure for this review article, you don't have one, and we can't, uh, you can't have it published until we have it and we need it tomorrow, um, this figure is exactly what it came from. So Eric Ruderman, a uh, rheumatologist who I worked with at Northwestern for a long, long time, um, and I had to get this, and we wrote this on the back of a napkin. Uh, so it was like the Laffer curve for those people who remember the Reagan, Reagan administration. And it turned out to be the silliest, most common sense figure I've ever seen. But as we have many, many new treatments going on, I actually think it's somewhat relevant now where it wasn't probably in 2006. So we think of it as a four quadrant model. But all it's doing is saying, what are the priorities of the patient that are in, that's in front of you to get it better? Because that's going to impact your selection of therapy. So quadrant ones, when you have limited psoriasis, Limit arthritis, probably something that's not progressive in arthritis. Can you use NSAIDs? Can you use topicals? Can you use methotrexate? Methotrexate's a pretty weak drug in psoriasis um, and is uh, modestly effective in psoriatic arthritis. But you can do things that you have time, you're not in a rush. Quadrant two is extensive psoriasis and mild arthritis. Those are the people who show up in the dermatology office primarily. And those are the folks who you have to think, What's going to get their skin better? Because while we want to treat their joints as well, that's not the priority moving forward. Limited psoriasis and severe arthritis the other way around. Maybe you want to use preferentially an anti-TNF, which isn't quite as good as some of the newer agents in treating uh, psoriasis, but they highly effective for psoriatic arthritis. And then finally, the extensive psoriasis and severe arthritis, you really need to hit on something that's going to hit both of them very hard. You have to think about what the patient in front of you, what their priority is, and what is the thing that needs to be treated most quickly. So we're going to go through a couple cases that I think will hopefully um, bring out some of the major issues uh, that we see when we're treating patients with psoriasis. So this is a 28-year-old woman who walks into the office. Um, I think that most people can make the diagnosis of psoriasis from across the room, uh, and most people can make the diagnosis of psoriasis across the room. Uh, but she clearly has greater than 10% body surface area. I, I think that's pretty obvious from the picture. Now, she's a nurse. She immigrated from Romania about three years prior to my first seeing her. She has severe skin disease, no doubt. But she's had it since she's age 12. So she's had it for about 16 years already. Uh, she has joint swelling and pain and stiffness since age 18. So the psoriasis came beforehand. Um, but it's really much localized joint pain, few fingers and toes. Um, Sometimes she's swollen, sometimes she's not. We can't always tell if the swelling is related to the inflammation in her extremities uh, from the psoriasis or actually within the joint space. Um, and it's, uh, the stiffness lasts for an hour, hour and a half. It varies a little bit. She's a nurse, and she's significant difficulty finding work due to her cutaneous disease. Her fingers aren't impacting her ability to work but her skin is preventing her from getting a job. And there's actually quite a bit of evidence that unemployment and underemployment is a significant, um, there's a significant impact of psoriasis and this particularly severe psoriasis on employment status. So I would put her in quadrant two, right? She has skin predominant disease, early joint disease, but that's not what's driving her. She needs to get better quickly. So a more significant issue related to quality of life, potential comorbid disease is due to her skin. And as I said, I consider employment issues comorbid disease as well. Topical therapy, as uh, Dr. Strober just said, and phototherapy just ain't going to work. You guys might have colleagues who are in dermatology will say, oh, I always have to go through topicals first. If you have this much body surface area, it is completely absurd to try topicals before you try systemic therapy. And in fact, there is clearly a relationship with that 10% number is that effectiveness of, sort of topical therapy goes way down at that 10% number. So this is a patient who needs internal medicine, has systemic therapy, but then how do you choose in that zoo of biologics and orals what is the best treatment for her? 
She has some pretty good evidence for joint disease, so you don't want to ignore it. And so we should determine, should we determine therapy based on what's best for her joints? She has a chronic disease, and so does speed matter in this? And I think that's an important question for everyone in treating uh, psoriasis. So there's a guy named Mark Lebel, who many of you know, who used to be the, the chair at Mount Sinai in New York, uh, who would always tell about how speed is centrally important for all his patients because he has politicians, he has actors, he has all these really important people who have to get better really quickly. So speed is something he really looks for for a medication. Not a big issue for me in Milwaukee, right? Um, and so you have to think about that patient in front of you and what's really driving them to get better. As Dr. Strober just said a few moments ago, um, some drugs are a little faster than others, but what we have today is so much faster than we had 10, 15 years ago. It's almost silly to even consider some of it sometimes unless it's a really emergent thing. And, and the most em who knows what the most emergent uh, issue for getting someone better as quickly as possible for um, psoriasis is? Anyone have a guess? Weddings. Weddings, yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. I have treated more patients on cyclosporin without that much psoriasis for weddings for my entire career. Um, and then your local dermatologist really only uses oral medication and a premolas, which is not an unusual situation and does not prescribe biologics. Is that an okay place to start? And I think that's another question you have to ask for the patients. First of all, I just want to put out psoriasis uh, methotrexate data, and I, I'm going a little off topic here, but I think a lot of rheumatologists don't know the methotrexate data for psoriasis, so I just wanted out there. This is the best trial of methotrexate called the METOP study. It was published a number of years ago as sub-Q methotrexate, actually aggressively dosed with 17.5 milligrams to start sub-Q. Um, and if you look at it, the POSI 75 result, uh, result comes out to be about 40 or 45 percent. If you think about that in the context of what we're talking about with the newer biologic agents, um, it's pretty poopy, okay? It's better than a premolast, uh, it's better than acetretin, but it's not a particularly uh, highly efficacious nor speedy treatment for psoriasis. So I'm going to put it out there. I'm not going to talk a lot about methotrexate, but I just want everyone to have some sense of where methotrexate fits in terms of the, in terms of the efficacy um, related to some of the agents we're going to talk about soon. So I like to think about things as classes. Instead of trying to think about each individual drug, I think in terms of big picture. And that's how I'm trying to decide what's best for the patient. So when we say, okay, you need systemic therapy, I say you have oral medicines, you have biologics, and let's think about the classes of medications. And do certain classes work better than others? And the answer is, yeah. But are the differences really all that significant? In some cases they are, but if you look at um, this is a network meta-analysis, and assuming all the difficulties in doing that kind of analysis, I just want to point out that you see to have a couple groups that seem to have different levels of efficacy, and they almost break out themselves. So you have the first three or four, sort of rizinkizumab, brutalumab, guselkumab, and ixikizumab, being significantly higher effectiveness. Then you sort of a middle range between secukinumab, ustikinumab, uh, sertilizumab, adalibumab, and then you get to things that are particularly uh, less efficacious, including etanercept and methotrexate in there too, as well, a premolast, um, and placebo tends not to work very well, thank you very much. Um, and so what you see is you have classes in how these work. Now sometimes there's crossing, so ixikizumab being an anti-IL-17 and rizikizumab um, being an anti-IL-23, both fit into that highly effective group. So you have certain groups that tend to be high, highly effective and then sort of modest effective. What does the POSI 75 or POSI 90 mean? It's a positive predictive value. What's the likelihood of that patient going to get better as the first shot agent, right? So think about ACR 20 or ACR 50. It's the same thing. It's what is the predictability of this medication going to be? And the patient I showed you just a second ago, that predictability is really important because she's really got a ton of disease and she can't get work. So you want something in that very high predictable um, group. This is looking at quality of life, which says basically the same thing. It's a number needed to treat analysis. But you see that in the top performing drugs, there's not all that much difference. So if you're just looking at predictability, you're not going to see a massive difference between, say, rizinkizumab, which a lot of people think is the highest effic efficacy drug, and Ixikizumab and Giselkimab, they're all in the same ballpark. 
And that comes out even clearer when you see head-to-head -head trials. Now, head-to-head -head trials are obviously designed by the people who are sponsoring the trial, right? So you're going to have things that are going to be uh, very effective. So if you look first to the, the figure on the right, which is the Eclipse trial, which was Guselkumab versus Sakikinumab, you see early on, there's really no difference between those two groups, and there's a non-inferiority analysis that's done where they're pretty similar. But you can see that the anti-IL-17 might work a little faster, but it's still pretty quick. The primary endpoint, that is down a year um, going down, it's probably uh, Guselkimab did win statistically, and that actually is a pretty significant difference. Um, but it's not tremendous. There's no reason you couldn't start looking at Sekikinumab as a drug of choice. Uh, Ixora is Ixikizumab, again, the speed favoring the anti-IL-17, but um, overall efficacy, and by week 24, this becomes pretty even. So what did we do, thinking of all these factors? Psoriasis predominant over psoriatic arthritis needs to get better quickly and um, is someone who really needs therapy because of her overall health. So she's skin predominant, so we need to send something that is predictably, predictably high level effect, effectiveness. We go directly to the anti-IL-17s and anti-IL-23s. Speed is important. She needs to get better. She can't get work. Anti-IL-17 has a marginal benefit, though not overwhelming advantage. Likely some peripheral psoriatic arthritis. Anti-IL-17 is probably a bit better. I think we all have a sense of that, but IL-23 is possible. So it looks to me that there are enough things favoring going with an anti-IL-17 that that's where we went. And we went for Ixikizumab for her. And she got better. She was down. I, I have this weird habit of forgetting to take pictures of people when they're doing well. I only take pictures when they're really bad. And so I don't have a follow-up picture, and I apologize for that. Uh, but in, in actuality, she did, she did quite well. She actually became employed at the hospital I worked at. Um, and um, was uh, quite happy and has remained on Ixikizumab now for a few years and has stayed stable. So, again, the skin driving it, the joints being a lesser concern, speed being a lesser concern, but still important enough that that's where we would choose to go to the drug that favors those two elements. Make sense to everyone? Let's go to the next case. This is a 23-year-old woman. This woman and I, 32-year-old uh, woman, excuse me, uh, this woman and I have had a long uh, history of taking care of her. She, I'll, I'll tell you a really funny story. So my wife's a gastroenterologist, and uh, when she became pregnant, she lived way out in the suburbs. Um, she had a horrible pustular flare of her psoriasis, and she walked into my wife's office for hyperemesis, and um, she had a horrible pustular flare of her psoriasis as well, and my wife goes, you really need to see a dermatologist. She goes, yeah, my dermatologist, I called him, I couldn't get in. My, she had no idea that my wife and I had the same last name, that we were related in any way. And so my wife calls up, can you take care of this woman who's trying to get through to, your, to an office that can't get into that horrible dermatologist? So yeah, it's my patient here. Thank you very much. Um, but she's a really nice woman and has a long history of work. So this is when we first started seeing her uh, when she was 23. And it essentially looked about the same as she did now. Uh, essentially, she presented initially to rheumatology um, for multiple tendon and swollen joints in her early 20s. She was in college and she, she stopped out of college for about a year because she just had horrible joint disease and she was having a hard time writing, um, things of that sort. Um, and so with her being at a young age um, and um, with her sense that um, she was sexually active, things of that sort, she wanted to get started on sertolizumab. The decision was started on sertolizumab um, every other week uh, because of the concern of pre pregnancy in the future um, and had a great response. Her joints did really well. But her skin pretty much looked like we showed those leg lesions right now, which was better than she was at baseline, but still quite a bit active and for a young person, still very concerning. So what do you do in a patient where she has psoriatic arthritis, it's under control, but her skin then becomes the issue. So there's no question her joints were the predominant issue to begin with, but that's now changed because her joints have gotten under control. Because it's one of those times that the rheumatologist was smarter than the dermatologist, right? So what do you do? Do you add topicals or phototherapy? Do you change the dose of sertolizumab? Do you add methotrexate? Or do you change the biologic completely? So let's go through our thinking about her. The first thing is, and, and I like to be a kind of a common sense kind of guy, of course you add a topical. Going to the dermatologist's office is similar to going to a bagel shop. You come out with a schmear, right? 
There's a well-known dermatologist named uh, Jerry Bagel who once was in the back of the room when I made that joke, and y'all, that re resembles me. Um, but the fact is, it is the easiest thing to think about. Now, now topicals can be pretty complex, because you all have said, okay, let me just try giving you the one topical I might remember, which is triamcinolone, because I can't keep all these things in my mind, or, or fluocinonide, or whichever one it is. And they'll say the pharmacist can only be used for two weeks. You can't be used on pretty much any part of the body because it's too strong. What do I do? It turns out topical therapies aren't, aren't so difficult. Topical steroids are, are highly effective. Um, you have to be concerned about the face, the underarms, the groin area, um, and that's about it. Um, for thinking and, and use is, you know, most people don't use it enough because it's so hard to be comp adherent to the therapies to get actually any side effects of it. If someone has over 80% of the body surface area, you hope they're not using it all over their entire body as well. Um, there are going to be, as, as uh, Bruce pointed out, a couple new uh, topicals over the next six months to a year. One's called Refumilast and one's called um, Topinaroff which uh, actually might take the question of what parts of your body you can't use topical steroids on, might take that out of the question, uh, which might be a, a huge boon for ability for anyone to prescribe topical therapies. But the point is, of course you use a topical therapy. And she has thick skin on her legs, uh, so you can use anything that's pretty potent. So we gave her a topical corticosteroid, we gave her fluocinonide, which is pretty potent, and said go ahead and use it until you get better. Um, it's really interesting how little information we have about top adding topicals to biologics. Um, there really has only been one good study, and that said that actually adding topicals to, a bio, to add a lipid may have made it worse. Um, we sort of thrown that one out. We're not paying attention to it, uh, but probably didn't add a whole heck of a lot. Um, and you can use the mild potency or high potency. Um, something a little stronger is absolutely fine. But what about the dose of the sertilizumab? And this is looking at Symposi-1, which was a trial uh, of uh, sertilizumab. And it's pretty clear that 400 milligrams every other week, chronically, works better than 200 milligrams every other week for sertilizumab. So the question is, in a young woman who is happy to be on sertilizumab because of other issues and her joints are doing great, can you change the dose of the medication? And the answer is, yeah. And the other thing is, can you change? So we don't have sertilizumab comparators, but we do have uh, comparators with adalibumab. And you can actually change the uh, from a high-functioning anti-TNF agent, not as good as some of the more modern agents, and go to uh, uh, anti-IL-23 like guselkumab and get a high level of efficacy. So actually that crossover, patients do quite well. And that's been now demonstrated with a number of agents. So um, there's very good data um, with uh, bimikizumab when it becomes available, with crossover from adalibumab, ustikinumab, or even secukinumab as well. And so there are, the possibility of changing is also quite reasonable. So what did we do? Well, we, as I said, we started the fluocinonide cream. And you know what? As a young woman, the likelihood of a young woman uh, using her creams as prescribed is just, and, and this is even worse for young men, by the way, having boys, uh, well, men now her age as my children, uh, yeah, they don't use it, okay? The, the chance is almost zero. She couldn't come in for phototherapy, and she lived in an apartment, so she couldn't have a home UVB unit. I actually, through COVID, have used a lot of home UVB, We you write a prescription and someone gets a unit at home, they don't have to come in, they feel very comfortable. We've used it a ton. But what the first question you have to ask before doing that is, does the patient live in a house, or does the patient live in an apartment? Because the unit's about that wide and a bit taller than me, and putting it in a house is fine. You put it in the basement, it's not an issue. Putting it in an apartment and then move around, theoretically, as a lot of young people do, it, it don't work very well. So um, phototherapy was really not an option for her. Uh, but since her joints were doing so well, and there was a reason to start the sertolizumab in the first place, we decided to increase the dose of the sertolizumab to 400 milligrams every other week. And she improved by about 75%. Was she completely clear? The answer was no. But she felt good enough that that was okay. I didn't have to push the envelope any farther. Um, and so the last few spots, we actually brought her in. We injected a little interlesional triamcinolone into the remaining spots. Um, and it pretty much cleared it up, and she stayed clear. In other words, we were able to just use the existing things and a little adjuvant to make her better so we didn't have to go and to make big changes in the class of medication. So what are my takeaways uh, from 
this. The main challenge to rheumatologists are the scenarios where the skin is the predominant issue, in my mind, or when the skin does not completely clear when the joints are doing well. And I think that's a challenge that all of us have faced frequently within our practices. For initial therapy, choosing based on skin as well as joint response is critical for the patient. The most recent biologics, that is the anti-IL-17s and anti-IL-23s, have pretty large advantages over the older biologics and oral therapies. Systemic therapies, even within classes, can behave differently. So as, as Dr. Uh, Strober mentioned, risinkizumab and tildrakizumab don't behave exactly the same way. Uh, risinkizumab may be much more highly effective. And they behave differentially in the skin, and dosing may be distinct between the treatment of skin and joint disease. And that's one of the questions and one of my takeaways that I say in my psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis clinic that I've been saying for a year. When's the most important time to use psoriatic arthritis dosing, which is almost always lower for biologics for uh, treatment of patients with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis? Joe, when's the right time? Yeah, never. That's the right answer. Um, it is my opinion there, there's never been shown to be a safety issue with using the psoriasis dosing regimens. I will always push to use the psoriasis dosing regimen if the patient has cutaneous disease because it works better for the skin. And there's even enough hint that it works better for the joints as well. Uh, so um, my own bias, I apologize if I've offended anyone uh, from any of the companies outside. And then there are multiple other options beyond systemic therapies that can aid in the treatment of cutaneous psoriasis that if you're doing well with your joints, you don't have to give up your med. You just have to figure out maybe there's something else you can do to make it work better. And with that, Thank you very much.